Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Case Western Reserve University and to our uh, second uh, collaboration uh, technology and engaging the uh, the campus uh, summit. Um, certainly glad that you've all uh, taken some time to join us here today. Um, so this uh, this session is uh, perspectives on real time uh, video collaboration. Uh, my name is Mike Cubitt. I'm the uh, director of Media Vision at Case Western, also the associate director of instructional technology and and academic computing. Uh, with us on this panel today, we're actually really excited to have sort of a mix of, of faculty who are using the technology on a day-to-day -day basis. We have some uh, technologists as well as uh, program administrators. So just to get a sense to kind of gauge the audience, um, how many of you are instructors? Okay. How many are technologists? And then uh, just administrators? Uh, good. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so joining us um, remotely uh, is uh, Heather Boyles, uh, the Director of uh, International Relations for Internet2. <clears throat> Heather, so glad you could join us today. Thanks for having me. Um, to my far right is uh, Mark Turner, the uh, Institute Professor and uh, Professor and Chair of Cognitive Science, and the Founding Director of the Cognitive Science Network here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, then uh, John uh, Clausey, uh, uh, Independence Foundation Professor of Nursing Education, uh, Director of Student Services and Learning Resource Center uh, for the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing uh, here at Case Western Reserve University. Um, to my right is Thomas Nabb, uh, CIO and Director of Academic uh, Research and Administrative Technology for the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, here at Case Western Reserve University. And to my left, uh, Miran Miragani, uh, the Goodrich Professor of Engineering Innovation, uh, Director of Science and Technology Application Center uh, here at Case as well. So the uh, session overview, we're gonna, we're gonna take about four minutes uh, per panelist just to kind of provide a description or an, or an overview of, of how they're actually using collaborative video technology in, in their uh, academic uh, teaching and instruction. Uh, we want to allow some time for discussion and allow as much time as we can for, for Q&A at the end. Um, so our approach, uh, just as a general overview, um, our approach to video conferencing here at Case Western, unlike maybe some of the other technologies that we provide in support of academic life, is, is not sort of a field of dreams uh, approach, uh, where, as you know, Kevin Costner was sort of directed to build it and they will come. That's not actually what our experience has been with video conferencing. Um, and, and we've, uh, our uh, reaction to that uh, is we've utilized several strategies where we offer technologies through grants. And Tom will talk a little bit more about that in, in his uh, comments. Um, and departments will actually apply for those grants and sort of provide some, some documentation or some rationale as far as how they will actually use the technology. Um, the reason that we took that approach is that early on in, in the technology availability and even what we've seen um, in K through 12 or either in other higher ed is there was a lot of money invested in, in video conferencing technology without a program to surround it with. Um, so consequently, there's a lot of video conferencing technology that's sitting collecting dust in, in various classrooms or in, in various schools around the country. Um, so we thought in order to really maximize the benefit and to utilize those resources to, to the best possible way, um, that was the approach that we took. Uh, so our goal for this session is to provide a broad perspective on, on utilizing uh, video collaboration tools. Um, like I said, we've assembled a, a panel of faculty and technologists to try to give you as broad a perspective as, as we can uh, and then allow some time for uh, discussion and for a Q&A at the end. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is turn the session over to Mark and um, allow him to, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, his experience. Um, hi, I'm Mark Turner. Uh, I went to school at Berkeley, home of 4.2 Berkeley Software Distribution Unix and Eric Schmidt and Bill Joy and that's where I cut my teeth. It's a very collaborative environment Unix is and I always just carried that with me. Uh, so when I first arrived at the University of Chicago in 1983 to teach, I required all of my graduate students to get uh, email accounts on a Unix machine that the astrophysics department allowed us to use and to learn how to have an FTP site so they could deposit their work and we could always communicate and so on. And you can just imagine um, 
26 years later, all of the kinds of uh, collaborative technologies uh, I've used uh, and trained other people to use. Uh, so I've written books collaboratively through digital virtual connections, things like that. So let's just jump up to something interesting. Uh, for example, one of the things we do here at Case is run a, a graduate program in cognitive linguistics. It's the only one in the United States. There are only two in the world. And what this means is we're sort of uh, an omphalos for the globe in cognitive linguistics. Um, we're the, the headquarters of the Cognitive Science Network, and we have a, an important program. So we also happen to have this wonderful H.323 uh, technology throughout CASE. And in the Cognitive Science Department, we use the high-tech rooms design put together by uh, Tom Knapp, Mike Cubitt. They're absolutely wonderful. We have polycoms and multiple cameras. And uh, we also have a video cart, video cart that we can roll around that has multi-point uh, video conferencing capability. And this is just seamlessly used by our graduate students, our professors, and our undergraduates. So we run a cognitive linguistics workshop every Monday night, 5.30 There are many people who come to 6 to 18 Crawford and sit in that room. But we also have lots of people from around the world who come on their own money, Fulbright from Russia, uh, faculty on sabbatical from Brazil. We've had people from all, all from four continents, many, many, uh, come and stay with us for a semester or a year in order to work with us in the room. But before they come, we bring them in by video conference so they get to know everybody in the room. We have a Google site for everybody's work with a page, a file cabinet of readings, stuff like that. And then after they go back home, uh, our, our role is once a member of the workshop, always a member of the workshop. So they come in for a half an hour at some point from, it was Portugal a couple of days ago, from Nanjing, China. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. They come in and they say, oh, hi, uh, it's good to see you, how's the baby, blah, blah, and then they, get, then they do their work. Um, and the, we also have undergraduate students, for example, who are taking joint video taught courses um, in Denmark and here, that, as an example, and the undergraduates in those courses have as part of their assignment to do a research project with someone in the other country. So they just fire up the video cart and off they go. Um, so we use this technology uh, all the time. Uh, the only difficulty is as campuses are more interested in security, we find it a little harder to make connections sometimes. So we have to call in you know, the hovering IT people to take us off the gatekeeper or something like that. I, I, it makes, it, it's like the good old days, uh, when, remember before spam? Right, and Unix email, you didn't have to worry about it. Well, more security sometimes makes collaboration harder. The last thing I'll say is that we don't just use these technologies, uh, Adobe Web Connect, in order to run editorial meetings and things like that. We also study them in cognitive science. So we have a program in the cognitive science of technology and the design, sort of cognitive engineering. People like uh, Christina Hooper Woolsey, adjunct in our department. Um, I write papers on things like how impossible it is for human beings to understand how their brains work. So they have, we have a much better understanding of our technology than we do of ourselves in a way, and much of our conception of ourselves is put together cognitively by reflection from the technologies that we've produced. You can get these papers on the Cognitive Science Network. They're free. That's it. Thanks, Mark. John? Well, it's going to be hard to follow what you had to say, Mark, because we're aspiring to do a lot of that. Um, this year was the first year that we started using um, somewhat widely the, the IP <clears throat> video conferencing. And it's been primarily to bring people in from other places to participate in seminars. What's exciting is having the technology and introducing faculty a little at a time because you know, as a, a faculty member who's always been trying to push a, a range of technologies, you know, this year we have one and in a year or two we have five and five years from now we have half the department or something. And uh, we're kind of on that trajectory, but we have a lot of really exciting things we're starting um, in July. Uh, the first is that we have a, a graduate program, the only one of its kind in the world until um, this year. Um, it's a, a subspecialty in our acute care nurse practitioner program uh, to prepare flight nurses for unstructured environments. And we have, we're collaborating with the Japanese university to offer it um, on their campus as well. So the technology will allow us to actually be present in, in the classroom there. Uh, we've been traveling back and forth some, but that makes it uh, uh, both travel expense, but I, 
I think some of us uh, are finding that the wear and tear on us traveling that distance um, gets to be a little bit much, so we're, we're enjoying the work actually a lot better um, being able to, to use this technology. Another uh, of our graduate programs in, in psych mental health, we're starting to use the technology primarily to teach our students how to use it because as clinicians, they'll use it um, for either um, seeing people in rural areas or getting consultation on some of their cases and, and that if they get used to the technology in our classroom, they'll be able to do it in the clinical as well. So we're building that and that'll be starting this year um, too. And uh, another thing that we do for our uh, professional doctorate is we offer courses ar around the, the country. We have uh, offer them in something like seven or eight states um, currently and they're either six days every day or two three-day blocks and our faculty go to the distant site to, to run the courses and for those where we go uh, for three days and then come back and then go the, the following week or two weeks later for three days uh, we hope to start this year the faculty be live on their site for the first term and in the second term the faculty will be here on campus interacting when we've had um, larger groups at distance sites, sometimes we've sent a couple faculty and what we're looking at um, this year is um, if one faculty is on site, maybe the second faculty can be here on campus and participate in, and help lead some of the activities. That <clears throat> That's a, a group of students um, who also tend to be technophobic. And so starting in July, a, a large number of them will be on campus for six days uh, for a course that I run. So what we'll do um, during part of the time is split the course in two and put part of the, the students in uh, an IP uh, video equipped room in our building and some across campus and, and part of the time I'll be with one group and part of the time the other so the students can experience it um, with the support of being here on campus so that we can start teaching them as well to participate this way and a final thing is a real exciting um, a project that we hope will be funded to start July 1. It's a, a collaboration, an interdisciplinary collaboration across five universities and, and five VA medical centers that um, we're going to be doing a, a health, I gotta get this right, health systems engineering curriculum um, together and we want to have our, our weekly seminars across all the universities and, and medical centers done this way and we've been meeting trying to arrange it using the technology as well. Great. All right. Very good. Thanks, John. Maran? Uh, I'm Maran Maragani from Electrical Engineering Computer Science. Um, I moved to San Diego in July of 2007, uh, still a full-time faculty of Case Western. Uh, to look at opportunities uh, for industry collaboration. Uh, a lot of the work we do in engineering is high tech and we'd like to tap into the uh, industry base in California as well as to more generally look to see what other opportunities exist for Case Western. I have traditionally had a very large research group. Uh, just to give you a feel, I have 11 PhD students, four postdocs, and a tech. And so part of this experiment was how can I run this group remotely? Uh, and and uh, so we put in place the IP video conferencing capability. I actually work out of my home office in San Diego. So there's a setup, two a pair of identical setups, one in my home office, one in my case office here. Uh, my group is used to meeting me, uh, meeting with me around the table in my office at Case, and so the transformation was that when they were sitting around the table in my office at Case, I would be on TV essentially. My students joke if someone asks where's Miranda, they'll say he's on TV. And, uh, and then on the other side, I would see uh, them. Uh, the setup allows to, to look at each other's laptop screens so we can run presentations while we see each other. And there's a really powerful, I, I've been quite impressed, document camera, which you can either write on there or put an object on there and, and look at the object uh, mutually on one side or another. Uh, to give you a, a, a 
field for how effective the video conferencing is in psychology of interaction. Uh, when I moved to San Diego in the first six months, we didn't have the infrastructure in place yet. And my interaction with my group was through phone calls and emails. And when I would come back, I, I usually am back on campus about uh, a week to 10 days every six weeks. I would get ambushed by my group and, and just had to go through meeting after meeting after meeting with the students. It was amazing, once the video conferencing capability went into place, uh, the first time I came to campus, it was like, hi, Mehran. You know, it wasn't like anything special. Um, so so it, it just uh, has uh, continued like that. The students drop in my office and dial me up. If I'm in my San Diego uh, uh, office, I'll answer. So it's just like coming, dropping by my office to see me. If I'm here, they do the same. It hasn't really changed anything in that respect. And I've been able to, through the system, run my interactions successfully. The department uh, has a little bit more getting used to the video conferencing. We have it actually in the department conference room, so I can participate in faculty meetings. Uh, it's a little bit less natural for faculty to, to get used to the fact that, yes, I'm available, I can participate in the meeting if they turn on the video conference uh, system. And uh, by the end of summer, I will be part of an exciting institute uh, in San Diego, uh, we meaning the case effort. Uh, we'll have a laboratory and we'll have a, a space for research personnel. And in fact, there's a classroom in this institute that we are constructing. And our goal is to have that classroom essentially be an extension of the classroom's case so that we can offer our curriculum at the institute as well as offer lectures from the institute over here at Case. So it's been quite effective for us. All right, terrific. Thanks, Maran. Uh, we're going to go to Heather now. So we have, uh, thanks to the tech support guys here, we have uh, Heather here remotely with uh, her presentation as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, oh, it's a pleasure to join you today via the video conferencing technology that you've just heard so much about. Um, just to let you know, uh, I'm sitting in my office in uh, Washington, D.C. Internet 2 has some offices here and uh, using uh, the H323 uh, technology that you heard mentioned before, a uh, small polycom. Uh, it's actually a little flat screen that rolls around on a cart because uh, we share it amongst uh, my office mates here. Um, although I've been I've been sort of hogging it this morning, so uh, because I've been on several uh, video conferences already with colleagues uh, uh, since we're a very distributed organization. Um, so I sent a couple of slides, and I think they may be up in front of you. I, my main sort of um, I'm a little different than some of the other panelists here. I work for Internet Two, as you heard, and and um, and. and uh, my main sort of um, message here today is uh, really to think internationally when you're thinking about the possibilities uh, for what you might do to to in use of this technology to enhance your uh, teaching and, and learning or research activities. Um, but I hardly need to really mention that given the uh, dimensions already uh, here on the panel of, of the number of ways this just works seamlessly uh, internationally as well as uh, domestically here in the U.S. One of the um, enablers of that besides the actual video conferencing technology itself and so on is uh, the university's connection to research and education networks. Um, and one of those research and education networks is the Internet2 network. Internet2 is the organization I work for. One of the things we do um, with all of our members um, is to provide a nationwide dedicated research and education network um, that is then connected to its counterpart networks around the world. And so um, if you've got some slides up there in front of you, um, you'll see one that is sort of a conceptual diagram of some of the connections that go uh, from the U.S. to uh, most parts of the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, uh, Australia, and, um, and uh, the next slide will give you then 
a list of the countries that have these kinds of dedicated research and education networks. And the point of this is really that you know most of these uh, uh, networks will connect universities, uh, other research organizations, sometimes government uh, entities, oftentimes primary and secondary schools, sometimes cultural institutions. And so if you've got some collaborators, uh, faculty members that you're working with at an institution in one of these countries, you can almost bet that they'll be connected to a similar kind of network uh, that you're connected to there. And you know, one of the things that enables is the use of this kind of video conferencing technology. Now, it also enables the use of higher quality video conferencing technology um, that um, you, you might see in some of the examples um, used there uh, that would allow, for example, um, uh, high definition quality video to be used over the network. So um, I have just a couple of, you've already heard a, great, a couple of great examples of uh, this technology in use. I have just a couple of, two more slides here, um, uh, collecting some of the examples that have gone on in the Internet2 community and particularly with our international uh, partners. The first one here was a, a project, sort of a one-time uh, interactive video conference with a number of institutions located around the world um, around this International Polar Year uh, event in March of 2008. And it really brought in not only uh, the scientists to talk to each other, um, but students as well, um, and gave them an opportunity uh, to um, you know, really ask questions of each other um, in these different sites. Now you can see one of the challenges, of course, with any kind of international um, or most kinds, most international uh, real-time interactive video conferences is the time zones. You see here they they pick some time zones that um, uh, where it was they were attempting to to make sure that uh, everybody could sort of reasonably participate. Um, but that is that is often one of the challenges uh, to doing this. Um, the second um, slide there, giving an example of, of one of these things that, uh, that's gone on for actually a very long time, since 1998, uh, Singapore uh, MIT Alliance. Um, and I just sort of pulled this out as an example because, you know, the previous example was a one-time event, but this is really something that's been going on for many, many years now um, and is a, essentially a shared classroom kind of experience um, using video conferencing. And they're doing dual degree programs between uh, NUS and NTU in uh, universities in Singapore and MIT. Um, and you can see the pictures there give you an idea of how they're using the technology in the classroom, probably very similar to some of the setups that you have there. So the, the just um, if, if you've got ideas um, or about people that you'd like to work with, institutions you'd like to work with around the world, and you have a question about whether they are reachable uh, via the Internet2 network connection that, that Case Western has there, um, please don't hesitate to contact me or my colleague Jocelyn Garrick. Um, you can also find on the web page listed there uh, a list of these uh, countries with research and education networks and some links to some of the uh, kinds of examples of international collaborations that people are undertaking. Great. Thanks, Heather. Tom? And I'm Tom Nabb with the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, this is all a great setup because if my overall perspective is that um, we have great faculty ideas and uh, teaching and learning needs. And uh, we also have some great technology. And we also have friends. There have been quite a number of times where someone will want to connect to somewhere in the world. I'm not quite sure how to get there. So I'll call up Heather and ask for a contact for a connection somewhere in the world. and. Uh, they'll help us out. So being part of the Internet2 consortium has been a, uh, and then the associated peer networks has been a great help also. Uh, one of the things I'd like to very briefly give you an overview on is an initiative in the College of Arts and Sciences uh, called World, Worldwide Learning Environment, where we're trying to seed some uh, pilot faculty activities that involve uh, collaboration using various kinds of technology for teaching and learning with partners around the world. Uh, if you'd like to follow up on this later, the, uh, uh, we'll 
on the uh, site that goes with this, we can uh, uh, post the, uh, the URL, but it's a uh, worldwide learning environment. Uh, we received uh, some generous support from the McGregor Fund, and we're in the third year of a three-year project to uh, try to find ways to develop new and innovative uh, international experiences into the lives of Case Western Reserve's undergraduates through travel, the development of international relationships and courses and programs, and through the use of advanced communications technologies. And just to give you a little flavor for that, I'd like to look at some of the funded projects. One of the first ones was uh, one, a museum studies course involving uh, John Grabowski, who's on our history faculty. He's also on the staff of uh, Western Reserve Historical Society, uh, involving a, a class that was uh, taught mainly here in Cleveland by Professor Grabowski. And the students were here at Case Western and at the University of Bill Kent in Turkey. So uh, Bill Kent had uh, set up a facility there, and the students uh, were uh, part of them, some of them were here, some of them were there. Uh, Professor Grabowski also uh, set up virtual office hours. He had a desktop system in his office, and we uh, helped them set up a desktop system in one of their libraries so they could have after hours sessions, and also that the students could collaborate via desktop video conferencing technology and not need the larger rooms, which can tend to be harder to get hold of. Uh, so that uh, you know, it was one, one example. Another one was where a uh, biology class that was uh, looking at uh, certain, the genetics of certain beans uh, that were used in certain parts of South Africa connected with some of the researchers and students in South Africa and really got a better grasp on what the overall context was. It wasn't just a, a biology exercise anymore. They were talking with the people who would benefit from what was going on and also understand some of the uh, issues involved with uh, uh, use of the research. It uh, made it much more real, and that involved a different set of interactive uh, technologies. Uh, Mark was alluding to some of it, but uh, Mark was also one of the recipients of support here to uh, explore informal undergraduate interactions with international peers. That was a little different model. Sometimes we think of these rooms that are all set up and classes going on. So uh, trying to just make it so that if you walked into the room, uh, it's just like connecting to uh, you know, someplace else in the world where that room is, uh, is virtually connected. And to have it happen when the parties are interested, not at some uh, big prearranged time. Uh, we've also been connecting to University of Buea in Cameroon. There's a whole issue there of what do you do with places where there are emerging networks? Uh, we haven't talked tech yet, but a lot of this H.323 internet uh, video conferencing technology is great, but it's uh, got a, a reasonably high threshold technologically. You need to make sure that the network has sufficient capacity and that you can get through the network and firewalls and other infrastructure adequately. So we started out with this uh, connecting via Skype because that worked. We found that sometimes if you have a uh, a need to do something, you can at least start with some basic te technology and then try to raise the bar on the technology as you go along, but not wait for the ideal environment. Get going with it. Uh, so I'll stop there. There are other great projects that have happened and are in progress of happening. Uh, um, I see Professor Cateranacci here. She's had a great project uh, involving uh, her Italian class and uh, professors in uh, Professor Balducci in, uh, in Italy, and the students were interacting with him over the semester, and then when they gave their final presentations, it was uh, raised the bar for them when they presented to him in addition to their colleagues and received feedback from him. And now she's embarked on another um, uh, project with uh, John Orlock for uh, playwriting and translation connected internationally. Great. Thanks, Tom. All right, so just um, for general uh, discussion, just a couple of questions to throw out to, to the panel, and, and maybe uh, Mark, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you and then, and then have uh, maybe Heather follow up. Um, why is the, what the video aspect of this collaboration, um, why is that so important? What, what differentiates that from, say, either a conference call or, or email correspondence? What is it that the, the interactive video, what does that bring to the, the learning experience of the, for the students? Uh, uh, that's easy. Human beings are evolved for advanced social cognition, which is absolutely effortless. You don't even realize it's going on. Uh, many of the tests in cognitive science for various kinds of conditions have to do with looking at someone's face 
and checking off what you can understand. I mean, you look, all you're seeing are photons and uh, longitudinal waves are striking you, so you're not actually seeing anybody else's mind. But when I'm looking at you and you're looking at me and we're looking at each other and have joint attention, it feels as if you, you can see into other people's consciousness and their states of disposition and, you know, you say, I see the anger in his face. Now, of course, you can't see anger, right? So um, this is just going back, you know, 50,000 years in evolution mm -hmm. to the root thing. Human beings are evolved to be in, in a little group and look at each other and engage attention jointly on something. That's uh, joint attention is crucial for uh, child development and for for learning. It's an it's essential part of how we learn. That's why we have chalkboards and things like this. So putting somebody's face on the screen when you're working with them uh, brings in a, a vast range of s seemingly invisible but extremely cognitively powerful uh, communication uh, abilities. And this includes gesture. Gesture is called the unmonitored channel because you don't realize you're gesturing. But in fact, a lot of work over 25 years shows the extraordinary utility of gesture. So, uh, you know, it's true that when you are like on Adobe Web Connect or something, you can just thumbs up for agree and mm -hmm. thumbs down for disagree, and you get a quick poll of the room. That's fine. You can have icons that are visual. But visual icons are not the same thing as actually seeing the body and coordinating the movement of the mouth with the sound that you're hearing. It's a huge leap. So for last comment, uh, I'm uh, working with a co-author on the second edition of a book that's 15 years old. And we wrote this book um, by, uh, by telephone, uh, mostly. He would come to my house sometimes, but we lived in different cities. And um, uh, we, we'd send documents back and forth with little editorial comments and, and so on. But often, you know, I'll have an earplug. I'd say, OK, we'll do this. And, he, and I would type, and he would type simultaneously. Okay. Now, what we do with this book, there are two sections of the book. And there's, it's, those won't be changed, but we're going to add a third. So now we're collaborating on a Google Doc where each of us sees immediately what the other one types with either Skype or iChat or um, a Google video chat. And you know, put in the built-in webcams and put in the, the earbuds. And you know, after five minutes of, ooh, isn't this goofy technology, you're right you're right back there. When you want to get a, a sense of what's going on, does the other person like what you're typing? Is this? It, they they prompt you to, to come up with things, and you just look back and forth at each other's faces. And it, uh, but this is not a surprise. Uh, cognitive scientists study the role of the visual and social cognition all the time, and um, it's it's not a surprise that this would create a radically different environment. Okay, terrific. Um, Heather, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, you know a lot of the the, the points of about the video aspect of this have probably already been made. I know I'll just share one um, example from my own work um, in working with our partners, our counterparts uh, in China. Uh, we annually put on a, a Chinese American networking symposium where we try to bring together. Uh, the folks working in the research and education networking communities in, in, in both countries. And, um, you know, we do this, um, uh, you know, obviously mostly um, you know, from our respective countries. And once in a great while, we'll have an opportunity to meet at a, at a, at a conference and, and discuss sort of the upcoming year's program. Um, we once tried to do this via phone conference and, uh, and it just failed miserably. Um, audio only um, and you know f so very lucky for us our colleagues in China uh, speak um, very good English but yet with an accent and, and of course I speak no Mandarin at all but um, we find that video conference is the only way that we can collaborate because it's just that being able to to see the person who's speaking to have a little, few, more visual cues particularly when you're um, working across uh, the world uh, with people who you know speak um, was accented English and again luckily for us in English um, but it, it really just um, was absolutely not possible to, to uh, work together 
um, in an audio only situation and we really needed to have the video and we use that on a, a um, bi-weekly basis essentially as we're planning the programs. Yeah, right, terrific. Um, so, Moran, a little bit of a follow-up on that. So, so you have the benefit of actually having a, a high-definition video conferencing link back to the campus. What does that bring to the visual interaction? I know you've talked about that a little yeah. bit in the past. I, I think a lot of people have a negative view of video conferencing uh, systems because what we've seen in the past are these uh, images with a lot of ghost features and and. Uh, lips are not synced with the sound that you get. Well, that's not at all the case with today's technology uh, predicated on this uh, high bandwidth connection. So uh, what is really nice about what makes this a natural interaction between me and my students from San Diego to Cleveland is, uh, is the bandwidth and allowing to have high definition uh, image on a high definition TV of one another. As uh, Mark mentioned, those facial expressions are, are really important. Uh, and, and the high definition TV, in fact, if I haven't shaven that day, they can tell. You know, it's, it's very natural. It's just like, uh, you know, you're in the room meeting with the person. If, you know, if I squint my eyes or something, a reaction like that, they can tell. If they do it, I can tell and say, oh, do you have a question? It seems like, it's a problem. And then, of course, uh, we, at, at least I can't help but to move when I'm talking. And having ghost uh, images would be very distracting. And so what, what makes it work is that it, it's very natural. You don't, you don't get what you normally think of video conferencing. Uh, that's critical. Great. If I can just, if I may just follow up on that sure. one. There was a wonderful demonstration at the uh, Internet 2 conference last week in uh, Arlington uh, by the Veterans Administration where they were showing some of their use of uh, high definition Cisco systems for remote medical consultations, you know, really serious uh, consultations. And uh, they, we saw a simulation of a psychiatric interaction with somebody who was up in Maine. And that person was, uh, who does this in, in, in reality also uh, was saying that he wants to be able to see if the person's sweating, uh, are their eyes dilated, you know, just lots of micro cues in addition to the gestures and things that tell him a lot about what's going on uh, uh, and that, that that higher definition is needed for the types of interactions that they require in that environment. Great. Uh, so, John, you you had mentioned that that you're somewhat of an early adopter. What 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 were some of the challenges, or maybe some of the obstacles that you had to overcome initially to to sort of adopt and begin to use this on a regular basis? Uh, me personally, are sure. Are, yes. Um, I, I think it's just shifting. You know, uh, to be honest, it's not the way I've done it before. Okay. Um, having taught um, years ago. Uh, distance ed via satellite mm -hmm. and you know the somehow the image caught up with the, the audio you know 10 seconds later and the like um, I, I, I think it, it's been uh, a pleasure to to experience the the updated technologies um, and then I, I think what I've been doing is trying to run around to convincing my colleagues going oh look this is really cool and versus you know what it was before um, so I think it's uh, experiencing it is the big thing. And um, what we find, and I think it's important for us and our students, is that we have a, a lot of competition, in a sense, in the academic world. And we're not the cheapest place, so we really rely on relationship. Mm. And I think Moran's comment on you really, you're really there with people is really important for us if we're going to use it with our students because the relationship is so important. Okay, great. Uh, just uh, take here a little bit of time to open up to the audience. Any, any questions? Uh, if you could use the microphone here that's on the stand, that would be terrific. Thank you. Good morning. Ron, I was here last year, and you were on the screen last year, I remember. And when I was sitting here, I said, gee, I recognize that man. <laughs> and when you said, you, you know, that you were that gentleman, it, it was a really good connection. So, you know, real life story that, that 
the video technology, I think, is, is exciting. Uh, my question is, we're talking a lot about collaboration among universities and R&D centers and so forth. How is this translating now into the commercialization with corporations? Are you beginning to use this um, video collaboration with uh, corporations uh, in the area of commercialization? I open that up to anybody. Well, I don't know about commercialization, but I've given a couple of seminars just from my home office, uh, and actually I've participated in some board meetings just sitting, and it's nice because I, I only need to wear a tie and a shirt. I, I can be wearing shorts sitting in San Diego under the table. but. Uh, <laughs> and 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 so so the uh, it it's very effective in that sense as well. One problem is uh, on my end the upload speed is is not always as good as it is on campus. Well, it's never as good as it is on campus, but sometimes it falls off because uh, the, the the node is loaded. But even then, uh, the picture, as you remember last year, is is pretty good. Uh, the companies don't always have a very good system. So the picture that I see from, for example, if I'm giving a seminar, the picture that I see from the audience is not that great. Uh, but they, they see a pretty good picture. Can I just jump on there too? Relative to, to commercial entities, another place I think I see us in academia using this is our collaborative research with commercial entities, and we have uh, a, a group of us working on a project right now with a, a software company. And we do phone conferences, and we find that the phone conferences are useless. And so we tend to then arrange a face-to-face -face meeting, which takes a lot of their time and ours to all get together. And, and this is certainly something that I think we need to, to explore using with them. Because again, we pay a lot of attention to the cues that, that Mark talked about. Because when we're talking on the phone, it's like, I hang up. We, we went down the list. We answered all the questions. And I'm completely dissatisfied with where I'm sitting. And neither one of us had the time to physically, w w our group to join them or them to come to us. So I, I think we'll see it used more with research maybe than some other things. Jump in just a second. I'll just mention that um, you know, um, Internet to uh, the community, um, which is primarily universities, but has invited you know has corporate members as well. Um, you know, has invited uh, corporate research sites and, and corporations to connect to the network, in particular to understand how they might use the same technologies either within their own businesses or in collaboration with uh, universities. So Johnson & Johnson for a long time has been connected, had two of its research labs connected, um, you know, th through the respective state networks to the national uh, Internet 2 network in order to explore using uh, high quality video conferencing to support research between its its two labs. So that's another example where um, you know you might might even think about if you've got some research collaborations with uh, corporations uh, potentially doing that over the network. With corporations, I, I sit on a, a couple of boards. One of which is a group of um, cognitive scientists, uh, cognitive scientists of economics and choice decision. Uh, and this is a not-for-profit research um, wing of a major corporation on consumer behavior. And I also consult with people who uh, create technology, design technology, video games, things. And I lived for five years in Silicon Valley. And I just go into the office and fire up the video cart, and they call me. And you know, for 30 seconds, it's there's technology. And then it's, it's uh, transparent. Uh, and so uh, it, it sounds difficult, but in fact, it's just really extremely easy. And human beings in corporations and in universities uh, make these connections uh, all the time. The corporations I work with are very slick about it. They just uh, push the button, and there you are. Let me actually add, when I'm on campus here, my wife and kids actually use the video conference to visit with me. Yeah. <laughs> We have another question? Yeah, it's kind of related to that. Um, kind of, I wanted to ask a more sort of nitty gritty kind of question, and that is, um, is this kind of a ubiquitous video conferencing? I mean, is it possible to do without, you know, constant support from an, 
you know, information technology staff. I mean, how much are they setting things up for you? How much are they troubleshooting? How much of this can you do by yourself? You know, I mean, just, I mean, that seems to be the biggest barrier to any kind of widespread adoption is that if you run into too many headaches, if people just say, it's, just, it's not worth it, I don't want, I want the aggravation. So I'm just curious, you all seem very enthusiastic, so does that mean that you have to have a very, very dedicated and very efficient information staff behind you to make that possible? I, I, I can answer that because uh, in, uh, they ship the system to me in uh, in San Diego, and so I, I opened it up. It's it's life size system, and uh, there's a big sheet that comes with it that says what is what, and what should be connected to what, which I did, and essentially at that point, one of uh, Mike's people helped me to set the the right. Uh, information on, on the various, on the router, on the modem, and all these things. And after that, it's just a one button call, like speed dialing. Uh, in the t uh, one year and nine months, there was only one time that something got reset on the router. And I had to get the uh, technician's help to figure out what it was and why my video conference system was not working. But otherwise, it's, it was very easy. And I think that's true when we're doing point to point, and mm -hmm. that's been my experience. And, and I mentioned we're, we're moving forward in July with this complex five universities and, and five VA medical centers, and it's real clear in, in that environment we're going to need support uh, on all kinds of ends because one or another of us aren't going to have something with that many players set the same as everybody else and we just know it's not going to work so we're planning for support there but again on the point to point i find it pretty easy and i would just add my experience is that initially some report uh some support is required to get it going also as a matter of course uh i'd suggest that you should do a test connection before you know the real connection if it's a group of people uh, because it's not as reliable and simple as just picking up the phone you know, that said, once after the initial connection, you know, people can usually operate it on their own. I, I know Mark has been particularly great at uh, helping people to learn how to fish in that regard, uh, and so they can do it on their own. Uh, uh, I, I would also say that some of those initial setups, even if they're done remotely, uh, from a positive point of view, can be opportunities to build the relationship that, you know, then you can, uh, by the time you actually get connected, you've got a friend out there. So. Uh, uh, it, that's my perspective on it. Uh, the, there's a social, cognitive social aspect to this. We have great support here at Case. They do, they, they just work wonders. Mm -hmm. And of course, we couldn't have put in the fiber optic network or figure out what kind of system to get or things like that. But once we get rolling, um, we can work with them on modifications and what would be useful and so on. So it's an interaction between the staff and, and the professors. It's, it's very important not to rely on the IT staff and to make certain that they go away. Because the history of technology is that when e people are extremely conservative about almost everything, um, you always have to find something they know well and sort of attach it to that. Uh, it, 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 the capital cost on any technology of time and attention is a little bit. But, and even if it's only this little, and if people don't learn that, spend the time to learn that, one hour, one day. They'll put up with 30 years of massive suffering every day to avoid spending that hour and a half, that, to avoid that capital cost, right? So you have to force them and say, here, this is how the workshop works. You're my graduate student. If you want to work with me, you learn this. Or I don't work with you. If you want to be in the workshop, you learn this. Or you're not in the workshop. And they forget that they had to be forced to do it because, of course, it immediately becomes internalized. And this is what every, all the young people here at Case, they've just internalized everything. It never occurred to them that there was anything to learn. This is to them just like a cell phone. Because it is, their cell phone is more complicated than running the polycom. Um, so you, you, there's always that initial hurdle of forcing people over the bump that they don't want to go over. And they won't if the IT people are always hovering around in the back of the room or if they're already always there at the call. You have to say, no, no, there's nobody here. Just here, do this, you know, and, and then <laughs> off they will go. As I say, once we got rolling and test connections and so on, the, you know, the faculty and the students run it. 
and IT's just in the background. The only problem we're having now, ever, is when security changes in network accessibility stops us from doing easy things because somewhere in the cloud that somebody has put on a barrier, right? For, for good reasons, but it screws us up. Yeah. Hey, time for one more quick question. Okay. I thank you all for being here today. It's, the information you've provided is, is very informative. My question is for Tom. Um, most of what we've been talking about has been uh, the use of the faculty in providing stuff. Have you found that your students then pick up the collaboration independently between themselves in this environment? Uh, I, I think from some of a lot of these seed projects, the students do then follow up. I mean, in that, uh, I mean, the prime example being some of the things that Mark has done. I, I think that does need to be structured to at least get it going initially, uh, get people used to making ad hoc connections and follow up connections. Uh, uh, and in general, what I've seen is that sometimes those. The students will pick up on it because it's easy for them and it's natural for them. Uh, they may not use the same technology. If we're using the H.323, they may follow up just with Skype video conferencing or something. Uh, so once you get those relationships going, I think the students do tend to keep going with it. Uh, it's a little bit more just during the duration of whatever their activity is than might be the case. But uh, uh, I do think they eat it up and, and uh, in, I, not, they're not continuing with it as much as I might like to see, but I think it's definitely moving in that direction. Okay, very good. All right, well, I want to appreciate uh, all of your time. Thanks for your attention and for the panelists uh, for your time as well.